Hi, my name is Alexandra, and I'm a bibliophile. Welcome back to A Lovely Jaunt, where we talk about literature. Today we will be moving into our second episode in literary theory, and I originally intended for this to be a single episode, part two, um, entitled Giving Good Answers, but it turns out I'm very enthusiastic about this topic, kind of knew that going in, and the content is really long, so I'm going to break it up into two parts. Okay. So uh, yeah, this is where, if you've already buckled up this way, we're gonna go buckle up this way because we're gonna get in deep. Third correct answer. The A stands for alchemy. Okay, so what the heck? Angel I get, adulteress, definitely get, that one makes sense to me. What does alchemy have to do with anything? Great question, gonna answer it in like 15 minutes. It's not gonna take me long at all. Um, first, I'm gonna kind of like go into what alchemy is and then I'm gonna bring it back around and tie it in with the novel. Okay. So alchemy is this sort of like superstitious medieval chemistry, right? It's kind of like the grandfather of like real chemistry that we have today. People in the Middle Ages thought that the Bible and a few other like sort of mysterious spiritual texts had this like, code that if you encrypt, decrypted it and broke it, and you could read what the symbolism meant, that it would give you basically a step-by-step -step instructional manage, manual for like turning coal and these iron and these low-level metals into gold, ultimately. Um, and if you didn't know, alchemy was heretical. You could get uh, basically what is excommunicated from the Catholic Church if you were into alchemy. Um, the Church did not like it. So why the heck would the Church care? Like, yeah, it's having to do with like interpreting spirit, the Bible and spiritual texts and that sort of thing. That's obviously core to what they're interested in. But, you know, the Church had a lot of different beliefs that could fall under superstition. So what made this one outside of canon, but this one in? Let us begin by talking about the cosmology of the Middle Ages. I don't know, I don't know why you guys watch my videos. So cosmology is basically worldview. How did they understand the universe was put together, right? So in the Middle Ages, they believed that the world was highly organized, that the universe as part of God's creation and God being this magnificently, infinitely intelligent being, created the universe with this highly attuned and beautiful sort of uh, orchestral interaction and, and beautiful order, right? So, um, one, it meant that the universe could be studied and it could be understood, that it was rational. The other thing is that it was highly organized and that highly complex organization revealed his own magnificent intelligence, right? So, um, before Copernicus, which Copernican theory is basically heliocentrism, that the sun is at the center of the universe and we're going around the sun, and obviously before that, it was widely believed that the Earth was at the center of the universe and everything was going around the Earth. Because egotism! It's really beautifully sung. Um, but so before Copernicus, they had like from the Middle Ages these beautiful rendered pieces of art. They're like these illuminated diagrams with the Earth at the center and it's showing sort of the movement of the planets and the stars and the sun around the Earth, which, by the way, to make that theory work, takes some really complicated mathematics. So they were no dumb dumbs, they just were starting with the wrong premise. Um, and it looked kind of like a clock face with these multiple gears and this movement, right? Um, they also had a strict hierarchical understanding. So in the Bible, there are angels and archangels. We know that Jesus is at the right hand of God the Father. Um, in, so clearly, there's these sort of power hierarchies and the hierarchy of the Catholic Church with its Pope, its archbishops and bishops, etc., is meant to be the earthly duplication of that system. It's supposed to reflect that system perfectly here on Earth. Um, and this further trickles down, you know, into secular um, power structures with the king and his lords all the way down to the common folk. Um, Dante's Inferno is another example of this hierarchical understanding with multiple levels of hell descending deeper and lower down with worse punishments for worse, worse sins. Um, but it did not stop there. So a lot of churches had these sort of elaborate paintings over the altar that depicted this concept, illustrating this hierarchy, where all kinds of animals would also be ranked. So there's a big debate about whether 
birds or lions were the noblest creatures, birds being so close to the heavenly realm. Um, and they believed this about plants, so there was a hierarchy of the noblest to least noble plants. And they believed it about minerals, including gold, which if you could guess, yes, it's at the top of the hierarchy. So, in medieval cosmology, everything falls into this hierarchy. Everything is put in its perfect order, ordered by God, and it is this divine, you know, feat by divine fiat. So, that's why, you know, the Pope can be the voice of God. He's particularly ordained and given that authority. That's why the kings have this divine right to rule. That's, the, that's where they are deriving these concepts. Therefore, to mess with this hierarchy, to try to move up or down, is a violation of God's will. Uh, to transmute iron into gold is tantamount to toppling the king, or even worse, toppling the pope. This is why alchemy is such a problematic concept in this cosmological system. Okay, so now we know why alchemy is bad. <laughs> Violating God's ordained order of the universe, flying in the face, of the very powers that made the or that made the universe exist in the first place, not a good idea. Um, flying in the face of the Pope and kingship, not a good idea. But what does it have to do with the Scarlet Lover letter? The Scarlet Level? What is wrong with me today? What does it have to do with the Scarlet Letter? Well, alchemy is very briefly mentioned in the book. You may not remember it, but when Hester's husband, Chillingworth, comes, uh, you know, he's like a weird scientist, torturer guy. He, like, abandons his wife in a new colony to go hang out with the Native Americans to find out everything that they know about herbology and all of the scientific discoveries that they've made. Uh, yeah, that guy. So he is an alchemist. He briefly mentions that he has studied the arts of alchemy. And the narrator tells us precisely when he visits Hester in prison. This is also the same moment where he actually takes partial responsibility for her guilt. He confesses, I am part of the problem. I am part of the reason why you committed adultery. It's partially my fault. What is the basis of his uh, guilt in this situation? It's not merely that he abandons her in this new colony in the Americas. Uh, remember, do you remember how Hester is described? She's tall. She has this beautiful skin. Her hair is long and shiny when she takes off her cap. Remember, she goes into the forest and is like, shmer. It's like, swing. Uh, she's got this phenomenal figure. Like, a girl has it going on. She's gorgeous, right? And, when, and she's taught, for all of this is described in sort of like contrast to the Puritan marms who are like dumpy and like, me, right? So, and then, do you remember how Chillingworth is described? He's old, he stoops, he's pra he's basically a humpback and he's got like a weird leg. Like dude is Quasimodo who's old and cruel and wants to torture people, right? So uh, he admits that he never should have married anyone, let alone Hester who is young and beautiful and intelligent and has kind of like her whole life in front of her. He recognizes that they're from different places in the hierarchy, but in a sense, he's trying to alchemize their very relationship. He's He's violating that hierarchy. Um, and that is where the center of his guilt is, is that he was not a good husband to her. And the reason why he was not a good husband to her is he wouldn't be a good husband to anybody because he's a cold, cruel, mean man. But because he's really transmuting, you know, iron into gold, he's, he's violating that God-ordained order in the universe. All right. So 10 minutes later, into my explanation, you can see how alchemy could be an answer to the same question. But let's take a look at how well supported all of these different arguments are, right? So obviously the strongest one is adultery. That's really, really core to the novel. It's very, very obvious. Even if you're not thinking about how do I interpret this novel, it's clear to you that the A stands for adultery. It's kind of, kind of the point. Um, Angel, also supported directly by the text, but you kind of have to read carefully. Remember that it was stated early in the book before you really get into the plot about his Hester and uh, everything that she goes through. So that one's kind of easy to forget. Probably on a second reading, reading you would pick that up unless the teacher is pointing it out to you. Third one, Alchemist. That one's actually the weakest one. It's the most interesting in my opinion, but you know, the word alchemy is mentioned like once in this one speech by blah blah blah. And yeah, there's connections to other things, but I have to really bring in a lot of outside information to solidify and shore up that argument. So 
While all of these answers I still think are true, some of them are stronger and better than others. Um, and while there are, there are also secondary sources, other literary papers that talk about A representing alchemy and why they think it is, but there are people arguing against it too. So that one's kind of like more up in the air. Um, so that alchemy is not sort of like a slam dunk answer in the way that angel and adultery are doesn't mean that it's wrong. It just means that it takes more evidence and argumentation to make a connection. Um, hence this 10 minute diatribe that we just sat through. But it also makes it far more interesting, and therein lies the sort of, I don't know, academic atmosphere of English literature, is that is the whole point, is that we're writing these papers, we're entering into these conversations across space and time with other people who have thought deeply about these works, and putting forth, okay, what's the best answer that we can do? Reading what other people have said, yeah, I agree with it in this way, no, I disagree with it in this way, and here's why. So good. So much fun. All right. So my goal so far was to show the ways in which multiple answers can be right. So I hope that that has become at least somewhat more clear. And also that some answers are stronger than others, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're wrong just because they're weaker. But, um, and, and basically, that the quality of the answer depends on how well the book supports it. Again, it always goes back to that primary evidence. That's how you know whether or not an answer is right or wrong. Um, a complex answer may be more tangentially supported, but it's still supported by the text. So let's take a look at how to determine if an answer is wrong. Quite simply, if answers are right because it says so in the book, answers are wrong because it doesn't say so in the book. Um, so now some answers are obviously wrong in the way that some answers are obviously right. So if A stands for adultery because the book said it, then A does not stand for Android. Why? Because the book did not say it. Um, not only is the word Android never used in the text, not only does no character appear to be an Android, um, but Android as a word did not appear until the 1800s, which would be anachronistic to the time setting of this book, which was occurring in the 1600s. So it would just like have nothing to do with the text. The, it cannot, it cannot stand for any A word, and this is a good way for you to be like, oh, does it stand for Apple? Prob probably not, maybe original sin, you could probably tie that one in, but Android definitely not. has nothing to do with it. Um, it has to stand for something that's relevant to the text. But there are times when wrong answers seem like they could be true, maybe I'm just not getting it, maybe I'm just not understanding it on the level that these other people are. So how do you um, differentiate between, you know, really bad answers that are clearly not right, and then sort of bad answers that could be true, but how do I tell the difference between a sort of bad answer and a sort of good answer, answer that is tangentially true? Um, and honestly, that can be really difficult. One way to check if an interpretation is on the right track is if you can connect it to the major ideas of the text. So again, going back to alchemy, it fit in with the other ideas of the Scarlet Letter because it's working within the space of sin and redemption, these ideas that come from the Judeo-Christian sort of worldview, right, in this framework. And if alchemy being heretical ties in with that, then we can see how it can t tie into this overall narrative about sin and redemption for the major characters of the work. In the case of Android, it doesn't really fit in. A lot of books that are deal or movies or TV shows that are dealing with this idea of androids and artificial intelligence are actually kind of questioning the idea of what it means to be human. Do human beings have souls? Do human beings have something other than an IQ that makes them uniquely valuable for life, right? So the Scarlet Letter isn't asking whether or not humans or androids have soul to begin with, that's already assumed. We're ask, asking questions about the status of the soul. Is the soul good? Is it evil? Is it naturally bent in one direction or another? And how do we redeem it if it has fallen short? Um, so in that way, again, Android is kind of outside of the realm of concepts that this book is dealing with. And when you find that an interpretation is off the mark of the major ideas of the book, even if it's intelligently written and seems somewhat convincing, then it's probably not a good interpretation. All right, so thank you for all of your patience as I ramble on about literary analysis, giving good answers, giving bad answers, how you know if your answer is right or wrong. 
I really hope this one was encouraging to those of you out there who might be finding your English classes a little bit difficult to keep up with or frustrating because you're not sure how to excel. I hope I've offered some insight and some explanation, maybe some guidelines for you to then turn around and go back to your reading and start parsing out how to, how to do well in your classes. Um, if you have any specific questions about a book that you're reading or um, you want like more expansion on this kind of idea of helping you to do well in an English class, let me know. Leave your comments down below. I will be happy to answer them. Um, and until next time, I'm still a bibliophile. <laughs>